Today we continue with our study of the book of Esther. Uh, three Sundays ago, we were on the introductory portion of Esther chapter 1. So, the word of the Lord from Esther chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. After these things, when the anger of the king Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vasti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king, and let the king appoint all officers in all provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given to them, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for he had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at, and when her father and mother had died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther was also taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food, and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace, and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now when the turn came for each young woman to go into King Ahasuerus, after being twelve months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with spices and ointments for women, when the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired, to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go in, and in the morning she would return to the second harem in custody of Shaz Gaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Hab Abihael, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. Then we go to our New Testament reading in Romans 12, beginning with verse 1. The word of the Lord. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, 
to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Thus far the reading of God's most holy and inerrant word. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may hear, read, learn, and inwardly digest them to our hearts, that through the comfort of your Holy Word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Congregation, of Christ. Here's a product description from Amazon, of course our favorite shopping place. And I quote, the frankincense and myrrh anointing oil is made in Israel using natural Galilee and Jerusalem virgin olive oil and scented with flowers and herb essences mentioned in the Bible, perfumed with frankincense and myrrh. Our text today mentions myrrh and other spices and ointments to make the king's harem of women beautiful and pleasing to the king. From our first lesson in the book of Esther, we learned that Ahasuerus, king of Persia, threw a lavish party for his officials and army for six months. He ruled a vast empire from his capital city of Susa. At the end of the first seven days of the party, the king summoned Vasti, the queen, to show her beauty to his men. But the queen refused to show herself to merry, drunken men. So what an embarrassment to the king, he who rules a vast empire of 127 promises, uh, provinces, cannot rule over his wife. The king was enraged. So he summoned his wise counselors, inquiring about what to do with his queen. His counselors then advised him to dethrone the queen, but the Bible is silent on how the king was, uh, how the queen was deposed. The counselors then advised the king to gather all the beautiful young virgins throughout the empire. From these women, a queen is to be chosen by the king. And so begins the search for Miss Persia. Esther, a beautiful young Jewish girl who lived in Susa, was one of the girls chosen by the king's officials. Vashti, the former queen, was described as lovely to look at. Esther was also described, and even better, having a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. In other words, she was not only beautiful, but she had a beautiful body. So out of all the women in the king's harem, Esther was chosen by the king to be his new queen. How did she become Miss Persia? Uh, during this competition, three times Esther was described as the young woman who won the favor of the one in charge of the competition, of all who those who saw her, and most importantly, of the king himself. Esther has an older cousin named Mordecai. So Mordecai was from the tribe of Benjamin, a detail that would turn out to be important later. His great-grandfather was one of those who had been exiled to Babylon when King Nebuchadnezzar conquered the southern kingdom of Judah in 586 BC, more than a hundred years before Esther became queen. Esther was orphaned at a young age, and so Mordecai raised her as her own, uh, his own daughter. Uh, we will see later that Mordecai had an important role in Esther's ascension as queen of Persia. This morning, so we will dwell on this theme. 
Esther wins Miss Persia by winning the favor of men under two headings. And I would refer you to our sermon notes. So first, Esther wins the favor of the king's men. The king's official in charge of this Miss Persia competition was a man named Haggai. He had custody of all the beautiful young virgins who were taken to the palace in search of a new queen. What were the qualifications to become the new queen? There were only three. She must be young, she must be beautiful, and she must be unmarried. That's it. She did not have to sing or dance or play a musical instrument or answer a few innocuous questions such as, what do you think of same-sex marriage? Or, have you ever been bullied, and if so, how did you handle it? None of these things. She only had to be beautiful, young, and unmarried. Esther had all these three most important qualities to be queen of Persia. And so in verse 9, we read, And the young woman pleased him and won his favor, that is, Haggai, in charge of the women. So those of us who know the story of Esther think of her as a passive, even unwilling participant in this competition. But this is not so. She was actively pursuing the title by pleasing the king's men. Obviously, her physical appearance pleased Haggai, but most likely he also, uh, she also won his favor by her pleasing character. A Miss Persia contestant does not uh, win by being grumpy, uh, boastful, and having an attitude. She has to be smiling at all times, humble and friendly to Haggai and all the other girls. So like contestants in more uh, modern beauty uh, con uh, pageants, the young women were made beautiful before the competition. For the first six months, they would be bathed with myrrh, an aromatic perfume, and the next six months with spices and ointments for women. So this is an unimaginable beauty treatment, even by today's standards. In addition, they were fed with royal food, obviously the best and most delicious food in the palace. Having secured Haggai's favor, she advanced to the final seven. Haggai gave them the required cosmetics and portion of food and the best place in the harem. In obedience to Mordecai's instructions, Esther, whose Hebrew name was Hadassah, which means myrtle, did not reveal her true Jewish identity. The name Mordecai also is derived from the Babylonian name Marduka, which contains uh, the, the Babylonian idol god's name Marduk. But this does not mean that Mordecai is a pagan worshiper. It was common for conquered peoples to be given new names by the conquering nations. Why would Mordecai hide their Jewish identity? Is it because of fear of being discriminated against? This is probable because Jews, uh, the Jews were exiles. But we see in the case of Daniel and his three friends that they were in the king's court even though they were known to be Jews. In fact, Daniel and his three friends politely refused to eat the royal food in the palace. Why they refused is not revealed by the text, but it is possible that they wanted to demonstrate to the Babylonians that they are different from them culturally and more importantly, religiously. They wanted to maintain their Jewish identity and King Nebuchadnezzar respected their beliefs. Esther and Mordecai had a different worldview. They hid their identity. Esther had no problem eating the royal food. 
Mordecai wanted Esther to be queen, and so he checked up on her in the proceedings every day. And she was succeeding in her efforts to win Miss Persia. Therefore, when we hear sermons urging women, be like Esther, what would that mean? It means comply and be assimilated by the world. This kind of exhortation is contrary to, the, uh, to what the scriptures command God's people. Although we are in the world, we are to be different from the world. As our Lord Jesus Christ says of his people in John 17, he prayed to God his Father, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. We are to flee from the world's desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life. For the world is passing away along, along with its desires. 1 John 2.16 If the world approves of murdering unborn and newborn infant, we must declare that it is murder because we are Christians. If the world delights in same-sex marriage and transgenderism, we must declare that it is sexual immorality for the word of God forbids these things. Unlike Esther and Mordecai, we must openly declare, not hide in fear, that we believe in God who created all things and in Jesus who saved us from sin and God's wrath and that we obey the word of God. And by God's grace and mercy, unbelievers around us will respect and not hinder our faith. So first, Esther wins the favor of the king's men. Secondly, Esther wins the favor of the king himself. After all the beautification treatments, the young woman, uh, women would be called into the king's cham bedchamber for a night, one by one. This is the women's best and greatest chance to be chosen as Miss Persia and the Queen of Persia. Whoever pleases the king most will become queen. Each of the young women who were selected to go into the king's bedchamber could choose whatever she wanted to take with her from the harem to the king's room. So one night, Esther's chance came. It was her turn to uh, go into the king's bedchamber. This was her first and last chance to become queen. So she took with her only the things that Haggai advised her to take. As a prelude to what happens next, we read in verse 15, Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And she did win the favor of all, and this time it was the king's favor. In verses 16 and 17, we read, And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace, the king loved Esther more than all the women, <clears throat> and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. The Bible obviously is silent on how Esther won grace and favor in his sight more than all the other virgins. Did she win his favor because of her, her pleasing character or her beautiful form? Most likely, it is both. She worked hard to be the most beautiful of all the young women, and surely she also worked hard to be pleasing to the king. So now she is queen of Persia. Most preachers would tell young women today, be like Esther and good things will happen to you. But what do we learn 
from other heroes of the faith in the Bible. Vashti obviously is not a hero of the faith, but we can learn from her. She resisted and fled from being paraded by her king in front of merry, drunken men. From the Bible's silence on the faith of Vashti, we might conclude that we, uh, she was not beheaded or killed or uh, in some other way, but she was exiled somewhere. Could Esther have done the same and avoided death? Maybe, but chances are she could have been executed if she refused to be part of the king's women. The heroes of the faith that come to mind are Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, four Jews who were living uh, as exiles in Persia. King Darius issued a decree that all people in his kingdom must only pray only to him. But Daniel continue, uh, continued to pray to God three times a day, openly in the sight of all the king's officials. In the morning, uh, so they uh, re reported Daniel's violation of the decree to the king, and he was cast into the lion's den. In the morning, the king went to see if Daniel was still alive. Daniel was still alive, declaring to the king, My God sent his angel and shut the king's, uh, the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. What happened next was sobering. The king had the men who reported Daniel thrown into the lion's den in themselves. In addition, the king issued a decree saying, In all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Daniel 6.26 Daniel's three friends were also openly faithful to God. The Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar built a golden image of himself and ordered all people in his kingdom to worship the image. The penalty for not doing so is the fiery furnace. Being faithful to God, the three Jewish men refused to bow down to the image. And so the king told them that they would be cast into the fiery furnace. But they declared to the king, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So when the three men did not die in the fiery furnace, the king issued a decree similar to King Darius's decree that all people in his kingdom must respect and honor the God of the three men. So Daniel and his three friends refused to abandon their faith in the God of heaven and earth on the pain of death. And they were rewarded and blessed by God for their faithfulness and boldness to declare their faith before the whole world. Esther could have done so, refusing to be part of the king's harem because of her faith. To be among the young women, uh, women who would be called into the king's bedchamber on any given night would violate God's law against sexual immorality and against marrying unbelievers. But Esther chose to comply, and not merely to comply, but to actively seek the favor of all the king's men and of the king himself to succeed in her quest to be queen of Persia. Beloved friends, Apostle Paul exhorts us, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is acceptable and ac uh, perfect 
and good and acceptable and perfect. Unlike Daniel, uh, Daniel and his three friends, Esther conformed to the world's standards, but she was still blessed by God. We will learn later that God still used her to save his people from genocide by the evil Persians. This does not mean, however, that it is right to conform to the thoughts, words, and deeds of this world because we will still be blessed. Rather, this shows us that God is able to fulfill all his promises in his word, even through evil, sinful people. The Apostle John exhorts us not to love this unbelieving, rebellious world because the Father does not love those who love this world. We are commanded, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak to you uh, against you as unbelievers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. 1 Peter 2.12 so our goal must not be winning the favor of people around us, but of God's favor, God who is our creator and savior. The church must be sold to a decaying and corrupt world and light to a darkened and perishing world. Therefore, if we are salt and light to the world, when an unbeliever visits our church or sees and hears of our righteous deeds. He will worship God and declare that God is really among you. 1 Corinthians 14, 25. May this be our goal today and forever. Let us pray. Almighty God, graciously grant that your word which we have heard may be inscribed inwardly on our hearts. As we receive your word meekly with pure affection, may our hearts be filled with love and reverence for you. Cause us to bear the fruit of the Spirit and to live in holiness, diligently following your commandments. And may it please you to use us to lead those who are lost, wandering, confused, into the way of truth. All this we pray for the honor and praise of your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.